So good afternoon or good morning or good evening to you guys, wherever you guys are. Uh, welcome to the GMI Competency in DEX World webinars. We have received some uh, questions in the registration process. This question we will discuss a little bit later on. Let me take control for the presentation in the beginning. So, okay, should work. All right, so before I start, let me take a few moments to introduce our speaker today. What happened here? Let's go back. Okay, here we are. To our speaker today, which is Bob Jones. You know, as some of you have known him, that may have seen him in previous webinars, but let me take again a moment to introduce him. Bob has over 30 years of experience in the EX world and is a Comp EX instructor and an instructor of the ICEX Comp PC scheme. If I get it right, because it's so complex. <laughs> He's <laughs> also an inspector, I remember the US UL STP committee. Uh, he can discuss this a little bit later on, but he's basically very, very qualified to talk about EX in general. And today we're talking about competency and he's very much more qualified for that because he's an instructor for both of the schemes available for EX competency today. Before we start, I need to take a few moments to talk about GMI, who we are, what we do and why we do it. So GMI, GM International, is a company, safety company. We design, manufacture, engineer intrinsically safe and SEAL certified devices, so safety interfaces for most automation packages from DCS to SCADA. In all the industrial sector, prevalently oil and gas, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, food and beverages, and so on. We have uh, offshore and non onshore. We have over 40 years of experience and we are very proud of our Italian origin. So we manufacture, design, engineer, basically do everything in our headquarters near Milan, Italy, in a state-of-the-art facility. On the other end, we are a global player present around the globe and we'll show you in a few moments. Let's go to the next slide, if I can manage that. I don't know. Okay. I think we went, okay, sorry guys. And a little bit of problem with the control today. So, because we are a safety company, we take special pride and special care in manufacturing our products. So we have state-of-the-art technologies, we have some patent, we have full traceability of the product from the incoming to the outgoing components. So one day you give us a serial number, we can tell you exactly who tested that product, what were the test results, which component batch were installed on there, and so on. We are ROS and REACH compliant, and we are functional safety management up to SEAL 3, so SC Systematic Capability 3 certification for the company, not only for the component. And we do this because we care about the environment, the people, and that we work for, with it to try to minimize the impact of the, you know, an accident in this world creates a lot of problem, not only for the life, but also for the planet we live in. So a better world is better for all of us. These are the products we manufacture from IS barrier to safety relays, isolators, power supply, which are still certified. One day you look up one of our webinars on power supply, why they are required to be still certified in safety applications multiplexers, uh, termination board for all the system out there, hard multiplexers, we have SPD or source protection device, we have a line of loop indicators, and we have a division that takes care of training and services in the functional safety domain, along with Tino, Tino van der Capelle, our good partner and uh, safety, functional safety director, many webinars we do with him also. And along with Bob, we are trying to, inst to start a program on the EX competency. We tried to begin this year, but uh, the COVID uh, put a little dent on it. We, we'll see, probably the end of the year or next year, we will also have some courses and training in the EX domain. 
we have direct subsidies around the globe. Now it is nine uh, in different areas, uh, Dubai, Moscow, Shanghai, Australia, and so on. We have many, many distributors. We run many courses and we have thousands of install installation around the world. So we have a pretty extensive uh, reference list of PTR. Oops, I went to one too far. So these are our customers, most of the system vendors, so from AV to Yokogawa. We are working with uh, many EPC on projects. We are proud to have many OEMs that use our product on their machines from gas turbo machinery, gas compressor, skids, oh, and it's okay, but <laughs> and we have many end users in the AV element. Bob, as he wants to start, I give up control and let him run the presentation. So you can go to the next slide. <laughs> it, guys, before we bo let Bob talk, let me remind you, there is a question and answer box there somewhere. You can use that to post questions throughout the webinars. We will answer them as we can. Uh, this is the only way you can talk to us today. Use that question and answer box. Okay, Bob, you can start. If I disappear, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere. Thank you, Paolo. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, as I mentioned, it's a little bit early here in Houston, um, but it's great to have this opportunity to speak to you and talk about this subject. So uh, again, as Paolo said, please uh, come back with questions during the chat and, and we'll try to answer these as we, as we proceed. So a little bit about competency and this, uh, this topic, I appreciate the fact that you've, you've decided to join us for this next hour to talk about it because it's very important. It's, uh, it's a topic that has become more and more important in the EX world. And I think as we go through this presentation over the next 35 to 40 minutes, you'll see why it's becoming so important. So let's define a little bit about what is competency. So competency is truly, if we, if we look at all the various uh, definitions, it's a combination of knowledge, skills, and behavior. So when we think about the EX triangle, right, uh, when we talk about hazardous locations, we have to have that proper combination of fuel to air to a source of ignition. When we have all three legs of that triangle, then we have uh, an explosion. Right? Well, competency is also a triangle. It's, it's a combination of the knowledge, what you've learned, what your experiences are. It could be formal training, the skills that you've actually applied, so the practical application of it, and then are you able to execute it repetitively, doing it over and over and over again. So here's one of the things that competency is not it doesn't necessarily mean that a person that has a lot of experience is necessarily competent. So, you know, as a good example, a, a residential electrician who wires new houses would not necessarily be competent to work on a drilling rig. They may have knowledge. They may have some of the basic uh, education. They understand electricity, but they don't necessarily have that behavior of dealing specifically with the applications that you might find in an oil and gas and facility. So every job position is different and they require different skills. You know, a great example as well as um, I've, been, I've been watching on YouTube, a lot of airline investigation accidents and all this good stuff and talking about pilot error. And it, in some cases it seems to be, there seems to be kind of a unique thread with a lot of these uh, accidents is, um, Pilots have so much experience, but they're not necessarily experienced on that particular plane. Or they may have knowledge about flying in a particular environment, but yet when it comes to flying at night, they, they, their skill set is, is not there. So the important thing to note is that competency should always be assessed by somebody, uh, by a supervisor, by either internal or external, and somebody should make that determination of whether or not that individual that is doing that job shall be assessed. And that's kind of the important thing to remember as well. So where did competency really start showing up with regards to the EX world? And we can pretty much go back to 1988 with the Piper Alpha explosion that took place off the North Sea. Um, 
this platform was owned by Occidental Petroleum. There was 167 people that lost their life. The, the Oxy uh, Piper Alpha accounted for about $3.4 billion, uh, the losses, and it, and it contributed about 10% of the total North Sea production. So going up until that point, when oil was first discovered in the North Sea, it was pretty much, let's get after it. It was very exciting times, the mid 80s, a lot of construction going on. And this was really a wake up call for the offshore oil and gas industry. And it affected not just the offshore industry, but also the onshore industry. Because everybody stopped and took a look and said, hey, what did we do wrong? How could this have happened? Uh, we had a lot of smart people, but we did some things that we probably should have taken, uh, well, obviously should have taken more concern about. So after Piper Alpha, there was what was called the Cullen Report, and it took about two years to complete, and it was published on the second anniversary of the disaster. There were 106 recommendations that were, were in the Cullen Report. Every single one of those recommendations were implemented. And one of the key things that was pointed out in the report was the employer should be now responsible for the competency of its employees. So this is where competency really started showing up with regards to the EX world. So every offshore operator carried out immediate wide ranging assessments of their installations and there were two key areas of improvement. Improvements of the permit to work management systems and the initiation of formal safety assessments. Uh, by the way, the Piper Alpha explosion, if you will, was not an electrical issue per se. Uh, it actually had more to do with the permit to work system and basically pressurizing a temporary uh, compressor unit that had a, uh, a flange on it that should not have been pressurized. The temporary flange failed and released an incredible amount of uh, gas Onto the, uh, onto the rig and it hit a source of ignition and, and that's what was the issue. But here's what happened out of that. Uh, after the Cullen report, all the owner operators and really not, not, they did this independently of what really came out from the Cullen report, but all the existing operators in the North Sea, all the technical advisors on the electrical and instrumentation side all got together and they started saying, hey, you know, what, how could have we done a better job? What could we do to make sure that we do not have this experience happen to us? And so they all got together and they came up with basically a competency program for the electrical operators. And it was developed and it, and it was established in 1994 at Aberdeen College. And it was called CompX or Competency and EX. <clears throat> So at the time when it was first developed, it was not mandated. It was more or less if you wanted to set foot on a BP rig or a shell rig in the North Sea, you had to have your complex qualification and you had to go to Aberdeen College and go through a week long course, get your certificate. You had to be trained and assessed and show that you were actually competent in EX. Now, as the, the EU regulations, the European Union came together. They came up with a couple different ATEX directives and some of you who are probably familiar with the ATEX product directive. But there was also an, another ATEX directive which is called the 153 directive. Now the 153 directive deals specifically with the health and safety of workers in a hazardous location. It doesn't deal like on product, it deals with the health and safety of the workers. Now this became mandatory within the UK and they called it the DSEER regulations, which applied to both onshore and offshore. What this basically meant is that before the directives, it was something that was really driven by the end user to say, hey, this is something that we insist upon. Now under the directives, it was now being put, put part in each country within Europe part of their regulations. And so <clears throat> what basically transpired, as soon as these directives came out, all of a sudden it gave the power for the regulators to go into a facility and say, hey, if somebody that you're putting in this plant doesn't know what they're doing, creates a situation where a potential explosive atmosphere turns into a deadly environment or, or something happens, 
you as the employer are now liable. And that really scared a lot of the owner operators and they said, well, we need to get people through programs. And that's where Compex really started taking off. So <clears throat> the, the standards, if you will, somewhat followed what the industry was requiring. Uh, the, the main international standards that we follow with regards to electrical equipment for hazardous area are really located in the 60079 and the 80079 set of IEC standards. These standards are adopted in Europe as EN standards and then adopted by each country. So as an example, you'll see the, the original base document, the 60079-14 standard, which is an electrical installation design selection and erection standard is adopted in the UK and known as a BSEN 60079 standard. So what happens is that these standards, the dash 14, the dash 17, which deals with inspections and maintenance of EX equipment, and the dash 34 standard, which applies to manufacturers, these are just three examples of where competency is now showing up. And we're gonna talk about that here in just a little bit. Now, just because a standard gets written and a standard is a, obviously a technical document that a lot of technical advisors come together, representatives from all over the world develop these IEC standards. Just because a standard gets published doesn't necessarily mean it has any regulatory impact. It really depends on who is the authority who has jurisdiction in that particular part of the world to where those standards really become a regulatory requirement. So as I mentioned, the HSC, or I didn't mention, but the HSC is the UK Health and Safety Executive. They are the ones that are the regulatory authority for every offshore or onshore oil and gas facility. So the HSC is the folks that will come into a facility and say, hey, uh, you're not following the standards, you're not doing everything right, we're gonna give you fines, we're gonna shut you down, we're gonna do whatever it is. In the United States, we have a couple different regulatory agencies. We have OSHA. Um, we also have the United States Coast Guard. We have BESI. Uh, the US Coast Guard has now really just recently started to adopt some of these competency requirements since they've adopted some of the IEC standards specifically for the offshore market. And you have other regulatory agencies like NOPSEMA in Australia that all define and recognize competency. The important thing to note really with this is there's a lot of regulatory agencies out there in the world that do require it, but in many cases where these competency requirements are really driven from are from the end users themselves. They are putting this in their specifications as part of their technical packages. So if you're a skid builder or if you're an, a contractor that's doing work for some of these large major oil and gas companies, it's very likely that you will start seeing competency show up in a lot of their specifications. Now this is brand new. This actually just came out earlier this month <clears throat> that I mentioned that the US Coast Guard is one of the regulators here in the United States. And they have basically come out with this, what is called a marine safety alert. And more or less what has happened is that the Coast Guard has done a significant amount of inspections of EX equipment around the LNG fueled ship industry. And we've done a lot of training with a lot of the Coast Guard inspectors and we've assisted them to try to figure out exactly what they're looking at. And they are determining that there's a significant amount of electrical equipment that's being installed and used that is not appropriate and they've had some issues. So now they are specifically coming out to the owner operators and saying, look, you need to comply with these competency requirements that are spelled out in the dash 14, the dash 17, and the dash 19 standard. The dash 19 standard deals specifically with repair and overhaul of EX equipment. And again, it states that it should be done by competent people. So, so Paolo, guys, we have a poll. So it seems like competency is, you know, coming up everywhere nowadays. It's uh, becoming a requirement by many standards. So we want to make sure you are listening to us. 
So <laughs> I launch a poll here. So there's a question, what standard, in, what standards include defined specific level of competence? So you guys can answer this. There is no, you know, no judging. See if you can answer uh, some of these uh, questions. Okay, guys. Is it a multiple choice or a single choice? Uh, it is, it is, there's multiple choice. It's not necessarily one answer. It's not necessarily one answer. So you guys, you know, if you don't know what to do, just click them all. Now, obviously, you know, competence is becoming a serious issue in all the aspects. And it makes sense, Bob. Yes. It's like you want to go to a dentist, you have a problem with your teeth, and you don't choose a, I don't know, a veterinary or a <laughs> You want no. somebody who is a dentist, so he's competent, and he's proven to you. He's got a big plaque on the wall, says he has a diploma, whatever, you know. Right. He says that he's competent. Of course, you also have to, that's not sufficient. You want maybe to ask some friends or whatever, but that is true. It's a good start. I mean, it's a good start. You want to have that. It, but uh, you don't expect this in our world sometimes, you know. You have people that, uh, you know, they come to training, they, they just have zero competency and they pretend, you know, to do a job. Right. Like selecting a product or writing a specification. It, the consequences could be disastrous. Absolutely. Okay, okay time to dismiss. Okay, guys, I think we talked enough. Let's end the poll. See what are the results. So these are the results. So majority so, yeah. of you said uh, 79.14? Right, right. And that's good. And that's, that's the primary standard that, that competency, and we, we haven't covered all these. We're going to talk about these here in, in just a second. But the 14 is the design erection standard. So that is kind of the standard in which competency is, is very much uh, relevant, but it's also within the DASH 17 standard. It's also referenced in the DASH 34 standard. The 10-1 standard has to deal specifically with area classifications. So it's actually, it is referenced within that. So uh, if you do area classifications, there is some uh, references to competency and the 61508 has to deal with functional safety and competency is very much involved in the uh, the standards both in the 61508 and the 61511 standards so competency is in these standards and is it can all the standards it's it's pretty much in all of them correct all right all right we'll close that and we'll move on we'll move on and i just Lockout to give you, you know, full view. Full view. Thank you. So, the uh, now we fast forward. Um, our, our, we've all heard about what happened with Deepwater Horizon. Of course, in this particular scenario, and back in 2010, 11 people died. Most people remember, obviously, the the environmental impact and the oil well that was spewing oil for over 90 days. Um, the economic impact was in excess in this case of $45 billion. So it was both a, a huge environmental uh, as obviously a very tragic event for the families of the 11 people that passed away. So Deepwater Horizon was also one of those events that really shook up the offshore oil industry uh, and it did change a lot of things. Now, just like the Cullen Report, there was, in this case, a report that was issued by the U.S. Coast Guard and BESI, uh, the two organizations, the regulatory authorities that had jurisdiction in the offshore market in the, in the U.S., that came out. And one of the things that they found out, and it was highlighted, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the equipment on board was in bad condition and severely corroded, and that a subcontractor's equipment was in poor condition and had been left in hazardous areas. Because of these deficiencies, there was no assurance that the electrical equipment was safe and could not have caused the explosions. Now, this, if you've seen the movie, and the movie is a phenomenal movie, if you haven't seen it, it's worth watching. The, the initial thought process and, and what, what showed in the movie was that the, the release when the BOP failed, the gas accumulated all over the rig and it was drawn in by the intake uh, 
into the engines, which oversped, which eventually led to the initial explosions. But in reality, what was actually the original belief, but it was never finally, finally determined, but it was thought that the actual initial explosion took place on the rig floor. And the only equipment that was actually on the rig floor was electrical equipment. So that's why they put this in there, that they said, hey, this very well could have been an EX electrical equipment issue that was the initial source of an explosion, but then obviously cascaded. So it was, it was obviously a, a very sobering event for everybody. And, um, and again, it changed the industry, certainly here in the United States, and it had repercuss repercussions all over the world. So here's the important thing with this. A lot of people think that if I just get a product that's certified, then I'm okay, right? But that's not really the case. Certification is important, but it's not the whole picture because it does rely on three things. It relies on the selection for the designed environment. It, is, it, it relies upon the installation practice. Have we installed it properly? And then have we maintained it in good working order? Now those pictures of what you see there, those two pictures on the left-hand side, those two photos are actually from equipment that were located in a zone one area the picture on your left is actually a, an EX motor that was operational in a zone one area. The picture in the middle was of a bell that was operational in a zone one area. The picture on the right was actually from a land rig uh, in a zone two area. Now the two pictures on your left, what's important to note there is that that equipment was only three years old. So as you can imagine, putting equipment into an EX area and not maintaining it not keeping on top of it, then it really doesn't help over the fact that if we could have a certified product that might have been perfectly fine when we did the initial installation, but if we haven't maintained it, then again, issues can arrive. So a lot of people think that this is really only operational people that we have to worry about. It's the folks that are actually doing the installation and maintenance, but that's actually not the case. So this was a, a report that came out from the HSC uh, quite a few years ago. Now this really dealt specifically with control systems, not necessarily with EX, but it's very indicative of where we see the root causes of industrial accidents. And so when we look at that pie chart, if we notice the biggest majority of the root causes actually come from the specification side of things. That means that somebody in an office somewhere uh, did either area classification incorrectly or maybe they selected the inappropriate product or it was classified as zone two or zone one, but yet they applied zone two products into it. It could have been all of those different kinds of things. So the important thing is, is realize that anywhere in this chain, it could be specifications, it could be changes after commissioning, that could be drilling a hole into an EX piece of equipment or doing some modification. So there's a lot of different things that go into that we really need to look at when we talk about competency. So as, as Paulo mentioned, we do inspections, we go into clients and we'll actually go and do their EX inspections on the behalf of the client. They may wish to have us come in take a look before the regulatory agencies come in or before a client may be coming in. So we'll come in and do, a, do an EX inspection on their skids and packages. And what we have found is generally somewhere between 20 and 45% failure rate with regards to there's an issue. Now, not all of these are necessarily issues that will cause an explosion, right? Uh, for example, if you have a product that doesn't have an appropriate label on it, okay, is that necessarily a, a real critical issue? No. However, if we have a, like, for example, on the right-hand side, we have a gas detection panel that very clearly states it's suitable for a non-hazardous area, but yet it's installed in a zone two hazardous area, well, that's a critical issue, right? That's not a product issue, that's a application issue. It should have never been applied in that. Now that's the root cause from that could be the specification, 
It could have come from um, any number of things, but somebody should have caught that within the chain before this actually got installed. But again, the root cause, the lack of training, knowledge, and competency. So Bob, you're saying, sorry, go back one Hello? slide here. Yeah, I'll launch the poll in a second. Let's go back one slide. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. So you said out of your inspection, you find 20 to 45% of the time you find issues with the... Yes. Wow. That's a lot. There's definitely miss people are, you know, competency is a big issue here. It's, I, you I, can't I, install a panel that is for non-hazard location, hazard location. Right. You must be incompetent because otherwise you are a delinquent. You know, if you're doing something on <laughs> purpose so, and all that. And, and there's, there's different things to look at when you're going through. And if you go through the Dash 17 standard, there are inspection tables that we use, that we go through and, and we use that as the basis to determine whether or not this equipment is either appropriate. And it could be anything from the T codes. It could be from the environmental ambient. It could be from a specification requirement of uh, must be for a high ambient or Maybe the gas group is incorrect, or maybe it's the wrong protection concept. There's a whole slew of different things, um, or it could be an installation procedure. Cable glands are not installed properly, or the improper uh, selection of cable glands. All of these are potential issues. And again, some of them are critical, and some of them are minor, and that you know are not necessarily safety critical issues, but they're certainly important. Well, you show that uh, motor, EX motor, uh, pretty rusted out. I mean, I'm sure that is no longer able to hold an explosion in there. You know. Yeah. How can yeah, that that's... motor do its job? That the, what we have, the problem is that um, chances are very little that inside a motor you have an, a, a spark or an arc, that, and then you have a gas presence outside. So the likelihood of happening is so small that typically it does not happen, but there you have like, it's like a bomb ticking, you know? Okay, right. so guys, let's see if you've been listening to us. We launch a new poll. It's uh, easy because we just gave you an answer. What is the leading root cause of industrial accidents? It doesn't sound obvious, but I, that um, HSC report you have is similar to many other reports out there. Uh, the, the numbers are very consistent. You have a lot of problem in the beginning. I, and I give it away to you. <laughs> and, uh, give a few moments for you guys to, uh, to answer. Uh, as I said, we're not voting or judging anybody. You know, get it right, get it wrong, doesn't matter. Just it's a way for us to see if you've been listening or if you, we need to clear some issue more clearly. Uh, okay, so I see that the answer, most of you answered correctly. Let me. Uh, the poll, you guys want to answer again? No, no more answer? Well, let's go like this. And the poll. So, a few of you have answered, I have answered correctly. Specification is the main cause of issues. Of course, right? Yep, yep. Yeah, specifications is somewhat the root cause of what we typically find. I mean, but again, all of those are issues. So. All, all cause issue, yes, but specification. We, and, you know, we find this uh, very often in our, uh, as a manufacturer of safety components, you know, we demand to have good specification to select the right and proper product for the application for the safety function, for example, you know, the safety relay, what you're trying to do. If right. you say I want a steel relay, it's not sufficient information to give you the right product. But very rarely, and with Tino, our functional safety yes, but we have a webinar. We, I think we already run a webinar on how to write as far as safety requirement specification, you know, because it's important. Often you don't see them correct. Well, okay, you, you continue, Bob. All right, so we'll, we'll get into the standards and we'll talk a little bit more about the training and assessment program. So again, I mentioned Dash 14 is, is one of those critical standards. So where do you find the information of what defines competency? So it's in Annex A of the Dash 14 standard. It tells you the scope, knowledge, and skills, and it defines basically three main roles. Responsible persons, these could be the project managers, project engineers, the operator technicians, these are the people that are doing the installation, uh, potentially could be selecting products, and then ultimately the designers as well. So these are the folks that are designing the systems. So we define what their roles are, 
And then we also define what the specific competencies are required by those particular roles. And then finally, there's an assessment portion of it, right? So it shall be verified and attributable or attributed at intervals relevant to national regulations that the person has the skill, can act competently, and has the relevant knowledge and understanding. So it, it's not very long. It's actually only about two, three pages long, but it, it more or less tells specifically what we expect of individuals that are operating in the EX world, what knowledge, skills, and levels of competency, and it defines it. Now, competency also, as I mentioned, it, it does show up in other standards, IEC standards. The DASH 25 standard is the standard for intrinsically safe electrical systems. And I bring this up because obviously GMI, a manufacturer of intrinsically safe equipment, uh, I know is run in a lot with people that are selecting IS. Well, guess what? There's a requirement within the DASH 25 standard that says, that the person who develops what is called that descriptive system document has the necessary competence to fulfill the task. That DSD is more or less your loop diagram. That's a requirement for every intrinsically safe circuit, which includes the entity parameters and lists the components, including the cable of an IS circuit. And, and this DSD, quite honestly, as I mentioned during our presentation or webinar, on six common mistakes that we find on IS, the lack of a DSD is one of the first things that I see, is that generally speaking, when I ask for a copy of the DSD uh, to do a, an inspection, usually I get a, a blank stare from the owner operator. So a lot of times uh, these don't exist. So, but this is a requirement. Now, as a manufacturer, the DASH 34 standard, this standard is actually a bolt-on to your ISO 9001. So if we have any manufacturers out there listening today, this competency requirement just came into play in the second edition that was published in 2018. And it's now defining competency for all the individuals that work for that company. And there shall be a way to make sure that those individuals are competent. Now here's the important thing to remember. It doesn't say these competency requirements and these things that you find in these standards, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go to an outside entity to gain your uh, assessments, if you will. These can be done internally. It can be done in-house, so to speak. But just realize that if you're ever audited or somebody asks questions, there should be documentation, there should be evidence that somebody has actually gone through and been deemed uh, competent. There is a new technical specification that's actually going to be published in May of next year. Because competency is showing up in so many different IEC standards, there's actually going to be a technical specification that will bring this all together. So it will take the relevant competency details as noted in 14, 17, 19, and others, and put into a single format as a recommendation to follow. So this will be interesting to see once it gets published. Uh, and again, once a standard gets or technical specification gets published, it's up to the regulators to make this a determination of whether or not they're gonna make this mandatory. So the two main world programs that, that have competency programs, um, a lot of questions on the two different ones. And there are more than just these, but these are the two that most people are familiar with. I mentioned a little bit about COMPEX and where it started off, but the IECEX also has a competency program. And I'm an instructor for both programs, an assessor. So I can speak and tell you honestly, good, bad, and different about both of them. So the COMPEX program, as I mentioned, it started in 1994. There are 14 knowledge assessment units. Some of the modules are specifically designed for operatives. Some of the modules are designed specifically for the designers and some and one particular module is really meant for the responsible person. So these, these training assessment programs under COMPEX follow the requirements that are spelled out specifically in 14, 17, um, 
and actually 19 as well, and the 80079 standards for mechanical equipment. So there's, again, you pick and choose the particular modules that applies to you. The most common is the 01 through 04 program, which is a four and a half to five day uh, combination of classroom and practical hands-on. So what you see over on your right-hand side, that's a picture of typical complex bays. These are bays that we have at our facility that we put students through and they have to do installations and inspections. There's an EX12 course that is strictly a classroom and that's specifically for designers and engineers and that's a five-day course. So the complex courses basically are really set for uh, a handful of days all the way to a full week. So they're, they're pretty involved. There are 52 centers throughout the world. Um, most of them are located in the UK, but there are some centers in various parts of the world. The scheme is owned by an organization out of the UK called JT Limited. All of the training assessment are run by third party organizations, but they're audited by JTL and JTL determines the course content to, deliver, to be delivered by a third party. Now, one of the big benefits I would say about Compex is that the course content, because it's basically in effect vetted by JTL is very similar to every Compex center that you go to. So there's a very much a consistency between the centers as to what they actually have to teach and assess you upon. Now under the IEC EX Certificate of Personnel Competency Program, this, this program has been around for probably about 12 years or so now. And this has to deal with, uh, just like IEC EX Certified Product, there is now a certificate for people. And there are 11 modules broken down into the 000 all the way up to the 01. Year, 010. Now the ones that are highlighted in blue there, the 001, that's a fundamentals course that you pretty much have to go through in order to take other modules. The 009 is the one that's really meant specifically for designers. So that those two would be somewhat equivalent to what is called the Compex 12 for the designers. So if you were a designer, you would probably go through the 001 and then follow that up with an 009. Now this, the way this is set up, again, it's somewhat pick and choose. You don't necessarily have to take all the modules. You don't have to take them all at the same time. You can do it over time, but it's, uh, it's basically broken down in this fashion. Now, there are IECEX certifying bodies for product, but there are also certifying bodies that offer the COPC scheme. Not all of the certifying bodies can provide the COPC. But if you go to the IECEX website, you can see the various organizations that are certified to do it. There are 15 certifying bodies that can actually issue these. Um, it's a very similar to a product certification, but the EXCB assesses the candidates based upon an operational document OD504. So if you really wanna find out more about the IECEX COPC scheme, you can go to the website there's a lot of documents, but that OD504 will give you a lot of information on the COPC scheme. Now there's also what is called a recognized training provider. So we are considered to be an IECEX recognized training provider. There are 32 of us around the world. Uh, we've been vetted by the IECEX to deliver the content around the IECEX scheme. Now here's the important thing, the candidates are not mandated to be trained by a training provider. So if you're sitting there and you say, well, wait a minute, I've got to contact one of these 32 recognized training providers, you actually do not. You can just contact an EXCB and say, I want to be assessed, okay? But a lot of people do want to get the training ahead of time before you go and get yourself assessed. So that's, that's how it works. As a recognized training provider, we do not do the assessment. It's actually done by the EXCB. So I do the training, but for example, we work with a, an EX certifying body that we will proxy the exam if it's a written exam. So as soon as we finish the training, we'll have an exam. Then we take that exam, we send it off to the EX certifying body for them to grade it. 
So that's typically how it's done. Now there are some practical modules under the IEC EX. This on the right hand side is our uh, EX003, which is an installation module for EXD, EXE, EXI. So these are actually portable units. So we can actually bring those to locations. We built these to where we can ship them anywhere. And so <clears throat> a lot of the training and assessment can be done anywhere in the world. Now, unlike Compex, each EXDB comes up with their own practical exercises approved by the IEC EX auditors. And most recognized training providers have teamed up with a certifying body in order to streamline that process, okay? The important thing to note is not all EXCBs are approved for all modules. As I mentioned, there was 11 different modules that you can pick and choose from. If you, you really need to double check with the certifying body to make sure that the module you want is available through them because not all of the certifying bodies are approved to be able to, to determine your competency with every module. The certificates either under COMPEX or the IECEX are valid for five years. And you can actually go to the IECEX website and just like you find EX certs on products, you can actually see EX certs on individuals. So you can download them and find them and all that good stuff. So the important thing is, right? Competency, hopefully you now understand it's, it's important. It's, it's not just product certification. It's a, um, it's the, as strong as the weakest link on your chain of EX, right? We spend an awful lot of money. We spend a lot of time selecting products. We do all the right things, but if we don't install it properly, we don't select it properly. We don't maintain it properly. Then of course it's, uh, it's, it's just not a good situation and potentially can be dangerous. So we don't want you to be that weakest link in the chain. I would definitely highly recommend that you look into the various competency programs that are out there um, and take advantage of it. Do more of your own research. And here's again, that same thing I wanted to emphasize. The training is not a requirement, but the assessment is. So training is fantastic. I love to train people. We do it all the time. But really the important thing is, is that we want to make sure that you are competent and we have to assess you to make sure that you get that certificate and that you've proven to a third party agency that you actually have a level of competency. So basically, Bob, you could say you could uh, go to a, an exam without taking the, the training class before. That's right. That's right. So yeah. we actually what are have the chances that? you pass the, class, the exam if you have not taken the training. So, so I know of a gentleman, he, uh, he unfortunately passed away two years ago. He was one of the first guys, good friend of mine out of Australia. Uh, he decided to go ahead and take, at the time there was 10 IECEX modules, now they've introduced an 11th, but he ended up just going to the UK and was assessed on all 10 modules. And now it took him six days to get it all done to go through all the exams, all the practical stuff, but he passed every single one of them. And I would have expected him to because that was his life. So, so he um, had the, his experience, you know, was... Yeah, he had the experience, he had the knowledge, he had the, ex and he was able to, to do all that. He was demonstrating his competency. So, right. um, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna prove So this. what's the next slide? No, it's okay, you have, uh, I was gonna, Show the next slide so we, you can, you know, eventually in the recording, you can go in there. We will send you guys a copy of the presentation. Then, you know, is our contact details so you can see them. Uh, okay. Uh, well, oh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we did receive uh, some questions through the registration process and we prepared some answers. I see there are no questions today. If you have any questions, you are more than welcome to post them live. Let me see if I can share the presentation with the question and answer and don't mess it up. Okay, <laughs> share. Okay, you guys see it? Okay, this was the, okay. I started the wrong place. Okay, good. 
This was our first question. Yeah. You say it correctly, Bob, right? Yes, yeah. So uh, a designer interested in the COPC, what modules would, would I recommend? Uh, I think I mentioned this in the presentation. Yeah, you mentioned that. But, yeah, the 001 and the 009 would be the two modules that I would say would really make sense. Um, to do that, to, to do the training and the assessment for both of those back to back is about a four day process. So it's about a day and a half of training on both of those modules and about a half day with an exam for both of them. So we actually offer that and that's actually what we're going to be doing in conjunction with GMI yeah, uh, at some point in time when, we, when we're able to get out and actually do a lot of this stuff. Yeah, today, you know, we, it's not a question we receive uh, today, but a lot of people are asking for online courses. So we know we can train online, but then you have the exam. The exam is a problem. Yeah, and, and that was a uh, question we, we uh, yeah, uh, about doing this online. And you can, and we can do this. The, the, the issue is, is how do we actually do the exam? And it has to be done in, in a way in which um, the EXCB will accept it. it. It basically, it has to be somebody either with the IEC EXCB or the recognized training provider that has been designated as the invigilator for the exam. So yeah, for example, have a physical presence, you have to have a physical presence or you could do it in an exam proxy facility that has to be set up to be able to allow you to come in and, in and a take similar it. way to you, Ryan is considering for the functional safety engineering course. Okay. Next question we have, well, this is, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is better. You are yeah. running both. Right. Yeah. Of course, you cannot say which one is better, but uh, maybe you can. Because yeah. I, one I of the two will not be happy. One yeah. Of the two bosses, yeah. They're, they're both fantastic. Uh, both programs. <laughs> yeah. Um, both of them are fantastic programs. Um, I, you know, I'll be happy to share with you offline if you want to contact me. To, uh, I can tell you some of the specific good, bad, and different. Um, I think the one thing that I mentioned about Compex, there is a great consistency amongst Compex, regardless of the center you go through. Under the IECEX, there's a lot more variation. Um, we're given a lot more free reign as far as what we actually teach in the COPC course, as opposed to the Compex. So we actually, I write the course materials for the COPC scheme but I also know what the student is gonna be assessed against. So for example, when we do the COPC, if we're doing it say for a specific company, we will use a lot of their information. If we have say all the people is from that particular company, then we'll take their specific information and we'll apply that to the COPC training to make it a lot more real world. So there's a little bit more flexibility that we can do under the COPC and as opposed to Compex. Okay. Both of them are recognized, um, Compex, because it's been around a lot longer. There's more people out there. I think there's probably 70,000 people that have been through Compex. And there's, I think at last count, something like 10 to 12 to 15,000 that have been through the COPC. I think you'll see the COPC over, over the next few years will grow. There's many, many more people that are wanting it and needing it and uh, it's showing up in a lot more specifications from clients. Okay, let's see the next question, which is uh, something similar. We need product, and I've been told we need competency to a specific standard, which is 7934. Right. What are my options? Right, so there's, right now, the competency programs, the COPC or Compex does not specifically address or have training programs specifically built for compliance to the 80079-34. Um, however, we have actually built, customized, if you will, a training program, but it's not recognized by the COPC or the IECEX or COMPEX. Um, but again, this can be done in-house. It can be done internally. Um, we can certainly provide assistance. So if we have any manufacturers out there that are interested in this, please just feel free to contact me and, and we can help kind of put that together for you. And uh, in fact, the next question is about how do we get more information? Uh, well, 
for both, there is a website, right? Right, right. So on the, I mentioned this on the IECEX, uh, the IECEX website, what you want to, what you want to go and get is a copy of the OD 504, which that is a document that provides the specification for competency assessment outcomes. In effect, what it's saying is that what should the candidate that goes through this particular module uh, should know and should be able to demonstrate. So for example, if you look at 001 fundamentals, it'll say, well, this individual should come in and have this level of experience, this level of knowledge, and this is what the individual should show uh, to determine their competency. And it does that for every module. The 502 is your application to become, uh, to go through the program. The 521 is really more for becoming a recognized training provider program, which is something I had to go through, um, but that's also on there as well. How about Compex? Where do people go? Yeah, so Compex, go to compex.org.uk and you can go and find out more about the various modules. Um, you can also go to and find centers um, that you can reach out to. You don't register through Compex to take Compex. You actually do that through those third party organizations. But within the Compex website, it has links to all of the various um, Compex centers around the world that you can reach out to and contact them and find out when they're holding courses and all that good stuff. We, you know, because we are a safety company, we run many webinars and we talk about EX, we also talk about financial safety. We do get, question about that also and one question was we are involved in SEAL what is the competency referenced where is competency referenced? well it's referenced in both standard C1508 and 511 right Bob yep yep and here's the key thing and, and Tino highlights this I know uh, the latest editions of these have now the wording has changed from shall <laughs> and not should so the moment that we start putting things like shall in there, that obviously uh, says, hey, you better do this. It's so a must. It's a must. So yes, competency is also a requirement in the financial safety domain, as much as in the EX domain. Yeah, and my okay. certificate has expired. <laughs> <laughs> Your certificate is fine. Uh, okay, well, I think we got, um, question here. I put a question here which is nothing to do or it is uh, uh, was this? Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. This what is uh, this was a question we had I think that came up. I'm not sure if it was in this group or we had from a, another person in one of the other webinars and it was a good question. Well, so if I want to design. Question, yes, it's uh, well you can answer this question with this. Uh, it doesn't matter. You just answer the question. The design. Yeah. So the design of an IS circuit, the Dash 11 standard tells us how to build an intrinsically safe device, right? But how to build a IS relay or an IS associated apparatus like a barrier or power supply is not really part of the training program and assessment program either under Compex or the COPC. Now, the design of an IS system, which is located in Dash 14 and Dash 25, that is covered under Compex and the IECEX COPC design modules. So um, if you're learning, if you want to learn more about how to build a particular product that's certified, that's not really under the competency programs, it's really more the application of those pieces of equipment once they're certified. However, people do ask and we do cover a lot of the fundamentals of what are the requirements of say, what is a flame proof box? What is increased safety? What is purging and pressurizing? All the protection concepts, but we don't get down to the nitty gritty on how to design it specifically. So. Well, well we are running into an hour. We had a few more questions here, but I think I'm gonna skip them and go to the bottom of it because we are running to our timing. And uh, I want to, uh, let me see if I can this while I'm on live here. I want to ask are you we guys how did we do? So I'm gonna launch a poll on that and skip to the end of the presentation. 
In fact, I just stopped sharing it and that makes it easy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, if you do have uh, some specific question which you could not post today, you didn't think of it or whatever reason, you can write us. Uh, I did show our content detail earlier on, so you can go back. All our webinars are recorded and they're shown on our YouTube page, GEM International, you look it up. Also, we have a lot of upcoming webinars, a different timing and different subjects. You can see them on our website, www.gminternational.com. And that's it for today. We let Bob go to get some real breakfast and I go for lunch. <laughs> you guys enjoy whatever you guys have to do for the rest of the day. Uh, let me see. And oh, by the way, Tino, Tino is, is watching. And, uh, oh, Tino is watching. And he's uh, Tino commenting, is he says, you did a great job, Bob. Uh, thank, th thank you, Tino. I Both of you, Tino and Bob, you know, are our you know, great partners and they are so, so knowledgeable in their you know, respective uh, field. That is amazing, amazing. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you, you very much again for being with us. All right, ciao. Ciao.